Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today's event on North Korea's ambitions for space. My name is Juliana Zeus, and I'm the research analyst here at RUSI for space security. Today's event forms part of a series uh, of events set to explore the non-traditional security challenges in the context of North Korea, funded by the UniKorea Foundation. Traditional security threats in this context usually focus on nuclear and missile capabilities, but North Korea's space ambitions in this context then are usually mentioned on the sidelines and often seen as a smokescreen for ballistic missile development. But today we'll take a more nuanced look asking questions such as, to what extent can the country's technological advances aid a space program? What are the plans regarding the recently announced reconnaissance satellite fleet? These and other questions will be tackled by our fantastic panel of experts. I'm honored to be joined today by Dr. Brian Whedon, Director of Program Planning for the Secure World Foundation, Melissa Hannum, affiliate with the Stanford Center for International Security and Cooperation, and Elizabeth Sim, author of the book, North Korea's Nuclear Cinema, Simulation and Neoliberal Politics from Bloomsbury Publishing. Uh, when the speakers come on screen, you'll excuse uh, Elizabeth and her camera won't come on. This is due to a connectivity issue. Please note that this event will be recorded and a recording will be made available online afterwards. We will begin with the prepared remarks of our speakers before moving on to a Q&A session. And I would ask you that you can uh, submit your questions at any time of the event, so even while um, the remarks are being presented. Please submit them through the Q&A box. Um, and yes, please do feel free to keep them coming in. Uh, please do state your name and affiliation as part of the question. And if you have a specific question directed at any of our panelists, uh, please say so as well. Without further ado, I'll hand over to Dr. Brian Whedon. Uh, Brian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Juliana, and thank you for inviting me to participate. Um, I, I thought I would lead off this morning or afternoon, depending on where you are in the world, um, by just giving a really quick overview of how I assess North Korea's space capabilities, including both space and counter space. Um, so that means, you know, how can they, what kind of technology basis do they have for being able to create their own space capabilities and counter space capabilities that can interfere with another country's space capabilities. The, um, the bottom line is they have very limited space capabilities. The, the strength, as one might expect, is their rocket technology. They have you know, clearly demonstrated ICBM class liquid fuel rockets. And by ICBM class, I'm talking about the, the range that they can cover is you know, in the thousands of, of kilometers if you're looking horizontal distance. Um, and, and North Korea is, is, is showing uh, a, a pretty good proclivity to, demo, to develop solid fuel technology and sort of on a pathway to, to get to that, which um, honestly has more implications for uh, ballistic missile use than it does for space use. Uh, but there are still some applications there for, for space use. Um, so the rockets are the strength. Um, when it comes to the satellites that go on top and provide all sorts of capabilities, uh, I would assess that as, as pretty poor. Uh, they've so far demonstrated very basic capabilities uh, to create components that provide things like uh, navigation and, and control um, and guidance or solar power, or even just you know standard optics, um, and as we're going to talk about in a minute here, they have a very poor record of reliability of the very limited number of satellites they're going to put into orbit. Um, they also, you know, a lot of people don't don't think about this, but when you put a satellite up, you need to be able to talk to it, right? You need to be able to, um, you know, send commands to the satellite and then receive information back, receive signals back, receive data back to really make use of it. Um, and they have very limited capabilities to do that. Uh, uh, essentially just limited to when satellites pass over the Korean peninsula and can talk back to ground stations located in North Korea. Um, by contrast, most other countries that have um, more robust space capabilities have ground stations located all around the world, or at least multiple spots around the world, that allows them to communicate with their satellites and downlink uh, data and, and receive signals at multiple points 
uh, which, you know, which is much more effective. For example, if you had a imagery satellite um, and your only ground station was in North Korea, you might only be able to get data back from it, um, you know, every day or so, depending upon the orbit, depending upon how things uh, how things move. Um, so, so that's a real limitation that I think is oftentimes missed in a lot of um, other evaluations. So, turning now to the satellites, this is a, a, a screen grab from uh, an official video of uh, KMS four that was put up in 2016, and this was a, a very big, very public event. They invited all these report, international reporters to come. And the satellite, frankly, is, is rather primitive for 2016. You can see it on the right, sort of in its folded up configuration, it looks like a big cube with some antennas on top and the dark sides are the solar panels. And on the left, you can see where the two side solar panels fold out and present sort of a, a, a unified um, uh, sort of front solar panel uh, to it. Um, uh, like the KMS-3 that was launched in 2012, KMS-4 was detected as tumbling in orbit relatively shortly after launch, which indicates it probably never was in a stable configuration, which is important because you need to be able to point the solar panels at the sun, maintain that pointing, and then point whatever payload you have, a, a transmitter or a camera at the Earth, and that requires having a stabilized satellite. Um, and, and, you know, there are people around the world that try to track radio signals from satellites and the, you know, the, those, the, those people never detected any significant radio signals coming from this, which, which uh, signals it was unlikely to ever have worked. Maybe it did for a little bit, but probably unlikely to have done so. Um, fact of the matter is that a lot of citizens in US, Europe, Japan can purchase better capabilities with their credit cards online than, than sort of what North Korea at the moment appears to be able to provide um, itself. So turning to the counter space, which is its ability, North Korea's ability to interfere or deny or even degrade and destroy the space capabilities of other countries. Um, this comes from a report that my organization puts out every year that assesses the counter space capabilities of up to now 11 different countries. You can see along the top there. Um, and I've highlighted the North Korean box uh, in red. Uh, the circle means none. So across all of these different categories that we measure, um, all, of, all of them, we assess North Korea as having none, uh, no demonstrated capabilities. Um, so that would be things like co-orbital anti-satellites, which are the ability to put a satellite into orbit that then maneuvers to approach another satellite and potentially do something nefarious. They haven't demonstrated anything like the technology basis to be able to do that. Um, direct ascent, which is the ability to launch a missile from the ground that has a, a kinetic kill vehicle that then collides with the satellite. Um, they certainly have the ballistic missile part. That, that, that's, that, that they, they know how to do that part, but they haven't demonstrated anything like the sophisticated hit to kill technology that would be needed uh, to do that. Um, direct energy, we haven't seen any, any public reporting at all of significant direct energy development. Um, and space situation awareness, which is the ability to track things in space, to be able to identify them, potentially target them. Uh, this, it's likely they have some very minimal things, maybe a couple of telescopes, um, but nothing that I would consider to be, uh, to be significant. Um, the one area we have seen is electronic warfare. Uh, which is the ability, we can think of it as jamming or interference with, with radio signals. Um, we have seen over the last decade or so, multiple reports of jamming interference with civil GPS signals that were detected along the border with South Korea and nearby coastal areas. Um, and those have come from primarily from civilian aircraft and also some civilian maritime traffic. Um, and there's some evidence that though that that jamming has been linked with uh, U.S. and South Korean military exercises. Um, so it's potential that it may actually be coming from the exercises and not from North Korea. But we're pretty certain that they have the capability to do this, in part because it is one of the easiest things to do. Um, again, people can go online and in various dark corners of the Internet, you can buy 
GPS jammers that'll put a bubble around your car or around your house of, you know, a hundred meters, something like that. Um, it, it's relatively easy to do, especially with the civil signals. What we don't know is whether or not they have any ability to interfere with the military grade GPS signals, which are very different signals. Uh, they're completely separate from the civilian one. Um, and we have not yet seen evidence they've been able to interfere with other satellite services, such as communication satellites. Although that is probably, they probably can, uh, because again, that is relatively easy to do compared to other things. Um, and then the last category that's not on here is cyber attacks. Uh, and that's because we, you know, it's very difficult to attribute cyber attacks, especially against space objects in specific countries. So we don't do that on a per country basis. Um, but it's likely that that North Korea does have at least some, if not significant, cyber capabilities against space assets because they've demonstrated, you know, relatively significant cyber capabilities in general across a broad range of targets. Um, and satellites and satellite ground control systems and satellite end user terminals are vulnerable to cyber attacks, just like anything else out there. So um, that was all I had prepared for opening remarks to kind of set the stage. And I'm, I'll turn the floor back over to Juliana. Thank you so much for this, Brian. And we'll go to Elizabeth next. Thank you, Juliana. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Shim. I'm a former journalist. I agreed to participate in this panel because I wanted to place North Korea's space ambitions in the context of its propaganda culture. Um, other experts here, Brian has given us a very impressive presentation um, and Melissa, I'm sure will too. And they're, while they're able to offer technical insights into the nuts and bolts of North Korea's space program, as a former reporter, um, I wanted to kind of share my some of my conclusions about why the news media uh, could be relied to draw attention to North Korea's space program. In reality, there may be very little that we actually may know about North Korea space or weapons programs. Um, these two kind of intermingle with each other in our imaginations. Um, North Korea doesn't invite scientists or engineers from the outside world to visit places like the Sohei Satellite Launching Station. So really, we're, we're left to rely on pictures to figure out what they're up to. So, and what we do know for sure is that Pyongyang wants us to take notice and write about these programs, um, wants journalists to write about these programs. So when I study North Korea's space pursuits, the story made for public consumption, uh, I mean, I see it as really beginning in April 2009 with the launch of the satellite KMS uh, Pyongyang Sun 2. And to be frank, North Korea has never been clear about its plans for space exploration. But its program has frequently been conflated with nuclear weapons, as Juliana mentioned earlier. Um, the 2000 launch, quite possibly the first to be covered on North Korean state television, was depicted as a sophisticated affair managed by technicians in, the initial, in a mission control center, kind of like the pictures we just saw earlier during Brian's presentation. Um, and they're facing a large flat screen showing the rocket on its launch pad all very um, spectacular, very impressive. And KCTV at the time hailed the launch as quote unquote, a revolutionary step in North Korean space development. Um, and we have to understand that in a resource strapped country like North Korea, this launch was without a doubt an auspicious event. Um, so North Korea, um, just, just reiterating, reiterating what I said earlier, North Korea neither confirmed nor denied at the time that the launch would enhance its ICBMs. But in the world outside North Korea's borders, the 2009 rocket launch was immediately interpreted, um, as Juliana mentioned, as a smokescreen for weapons development and refinement. Um, we may recall that the Obama administration had warned ahead of that launch that it would seek to place additional sanctions against North Korea and the United Nations Security Council. And reports suggested that North Korea was developing a dangerous nuclear weapons program behind the facade of a non-military satellite launch, similar to the Soviet plan for Sputnik launch in 1957. So put another way, the launch and its ties to North Korea's weapons development mostly originated from outside speculation. And to be frank, North Korea never stopped us from speculating or taking the, you know, taking our educated guesses in that direction. Um, 
so you know North Korea officially never made that connection um, and meanwhile ordinary North Koreans struggling to survive in their country's post famine era may still have very little insight into their country's space program or nuclear policy and you know this brings us to a missing piece of the North Korea space program puzzle. While we in the outside world expend some level of intellectual capital to piece together clues about the program, we have taken less of an interest in understanding how these launches and the fanfare around the events affect ordinary North Koreans, ordinary people, or whether the news reaches them at all. It's worth remembering North Koreans, particularly in rural areas, don't have access to electricity, and therefore television. So who is this space program for? Um, some North Koreans defectors after crossing into the South have surmised that Kim Jong-il staged the spectacle to build cohesion among an increasingly differentiated population that had fewer reasons to rely on the state than under Kim Il-sung. Restoring the reality of North Korea's military on television was one way to reinforce the spectacle. And while North Koreans may not watch CNN or the BBC because of lack of access, television's power of diffusion, its reach and exceptional power is an important source of information across the globe, thereby in at least some ways affecting global decisions, which helps North Korea sow its message around the world. It's also important to remember global decisions affect the fate of ordinary people in North Korea, and that the North Korean government is very well of this fact and sanctions are just one example. We need to begin to understand North Korea's space or weapons programs as a spectacle driven configuration. This is of course not the only way to understand the program but one of many. Within this spectacle driven configuration, the Yongbyon Nuclear Scientific Research Center or the Sohei Satellite Launching Station, they all function you know, pretty much like props on a movie set props that uh, restore the reality of North Korea's military on networks like CNN or the BBC by providing injections of the physical world to keep the, uh, the spectacle or the simulacrum alive. So in conclusion, um, we cannot study North Korea's space program. I would, I would argue we cannot study it without placing it within the context of North Korean media tactics. We also cannot study the program without first asking, how does drawing international public attention to the program benefit the state and reinforce its power over its people? We must ask why the program was brought to our attention in the first place. For the launch of the KMC, KMS-3 satellite on April 13, 2012, for example, North Korea invited foreign television broadcasters, including CNN, uh, NHK, the BBC, and even Voice of America. Uh, and VOA is the same organization that uh, has been, you know, delivering information about the outside world to North Koreans um, who can receive the signals. Um, and then, um, if you recall, the KMS-3 failed to enter orbit in April. So North Korea launched a replacement satellite, the KMS-3 Unit 2, on December 12, 2012. Again, we must remember that weapons made for spectacle on global video platforms change the very nature of weapons. Um, by reaching millions of people around the world as an authoritative source of information, they subsidize a new kind of change that fuels our postmodern world of images, of fungible truths. They contribute to what American philosopher Mark Poster has described as a fundamental mutation both in the object world and in the disposition of the subject. So before I stop, I would like to leave you with a quote from Poster, who observed in 1995 that technical innovations in the late 1980s and early 1990s made possible the reduction of constraints. Um, the, the digital encoding of sound, text and image, the introduction of fiber optic lines replacing copper wire, the ability to transmit digitally encoded images and the subsequent ability to compress this information, the vast expansion of the frequency range for wireless transmission, innovations in switching technology and a number of other advances have so enlarged the quantity and types of information that may soon be able to be transmitted that a quality, qualitative change in the culture, that is our everyday lives may also be, be imminent. 
So what does that mean when we perceive, when we, when we consume images in North Korea's space program? And I think um, in our current virtual age, it may be time to ask what this change is in order to really understand North Korea's motives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, last but not least, we'll go to Melissa. Thank you, Juliana and Brucey, for having me. I really appreciate it. It's nice to be surrounded by really excellent colleagues like Brian and Elizabeth. Um, I thought I'd speak a little bit about how North Korea's uh, military rocketry and civilian space launch vehicles are really intertwined in uh, the pursuit of space and talk a little bit about uh, why that's not particularly unusual in our world. Um, the US, Russia, China, and many others have all pursued uh, civilian space programs while also conducting uh, military equipment tests at the same time. And that's the typical path really to, to, to that. So North Korea is not an outlier in wanting to do that. Um, the main difference between a ICBM, for example, and a space launch vehicle is that an ICBM it departs Earth through the atmosphere and goes into space. Uh, and then it has to come back down through the atmosphere again to a target. And so the payload of that um, ICBM needs to protect its, its nuclear weapon, most likely, um, going through the atmosphere twice. Uh, it has to protect it from the heat, the pressure, the vibration uh, that does that. And then it has to have some kind of targeting capability for it to land uh, at its intended target. A space launch vehicle uh, really just goes through the atmosphere once and delivers its payload, which is most likely a satellite or something of that nature into space. And so, when you're building a rocket, which could be military or civilian, you still have the same components where you have perhaps a stage of the rocket that needs an engine, some liquid and uh, fuel and oxidizer. All of that type of technology is the same, regardless of whether it's for a civilian space program or a military ICBM program. And that's how North Korea has developed its uh, rockets, which just as Brian said, are really the stars of North Korea's space program. And a lot of people believe that the uh, Kwangyongsong sa uh, satellites are so underdeveloped because the intention has always been on the rocket rather than on the um, peaceful space use of having a satellite uh, as its uh, ultimate goal. Um, so, you know, some of the old timers in the group may re recall the Pekdusan and the Tepedong series missiles. These um, missiles uh, were, were basically um, some of their SCUD missile technology, which they had adop adopted from Russia elongated and then bunched together in clusters. And you know, while the US and other countries assess these as missiles from the beginning, um, they make very poor missiles because their fuel is not that energetic. Um, it, it takes a lot of fuel to get the distance that it needs to go, which makes it very heavy and not so aerodynamic. And um, it takes a long time to set them up. So you may recall, um, you know, even when we got to, you know, not so much Tebodong 2, but we were calling them Unha by that time, 38 North and many other think tanks out there were watching North Korea set up at the Sohei space station and literally stacking up the missile as they prepared for launch. And for days or well over a week, we'd be getting ready for the launch. And in a war scenario, you never want to have that much time. It makes a target, right? So, um, you know, I think indeed that the Tepedong and Unha class missiles that we call missiles were really space launch vehicles. They were 
you know, not well suited to warfare. And um, in fact, they were more about learning the technology for building their later series missiles. So in 2017, when we had the Hwasong 14, the Hwasong 15, and now we're contending with the Hwasong 17 ICBMs, these rockets have much, much more energetic fuel, meaning it takes less of it to go farther or to carry more weight. And um, they also are road mobile. So you don't have to take as much time setting them up at a launch pad as you do um, you know, for, the, for the Sohei space station where they would launch their, um, their Tapadong series or their Unha series rockets. So the um, new launch pad is the Sunan Air Base, which is right near Pyongyang. And I think that has some uh, propaganda value to it, um, being near the capital city. It's also near a civilian airport, which makes it a pretty dangerous place to strike if you uh, were thinking about a preemptive attack on North Korea. And um, they are now launching their vehicles um, on a, a huge truck, which is road mobile, and they erect the, the rockets and then uh, are able to fuel it and launch it. Um, there have been some quite interesting tests in the last uh, few months, this in 2022, which they have said are for space purposes. Um, there's been an unknown rocket test uh, that is unnamed and, and North Korea has put out statements about it, but have not named the rocket. And it dates back to February 26th. Um, there was a test on February 26th where they announced that they were testing cameras for their um, space program, cameras that could take um, images of the earth and they released the images of the earth and they looked terrible. I mean, there, there was really very little you could see of the earth at, at least at the resolution that they released them to the world. Um, so again, you know, many analysts, including myself, um, are thinking that while this recent bout of testing, um, you, if you're, if you're, if you want to follow along with me to see what they're testing, typically what they're, they're launching is a lofted trajectory, which means it goes quite high and then doesn't come down very low from there. Um, but it goes up about 500, 600 kilometers and then comes down sort of 270, 300-ish kilometers into the sea next to Korea and in between Korea and Japan, I'll call it that. And, um, you know, while they've made this um, assertion that they're testing cameras on a rocket, it's really not something we see in satellite development. Um, no other satellites typically do this. You know, even universities that put up satellites uh, uh, as payloads in commercial space launch vehicles, they really don't test cameras in this way. And it's looking much more like this is a test of perhaps uh, the first stage of the Hwasong 17 ICBM which has not been functioning properly. So even though they've declared that the Hwasong 17 ICBM, which is the, the ICBM, if you remember in the parade, the biggest one, 11 axle vehicle, um, it's just got a huge diameter. It goes much, you know, if it works, it would go much farther than anywhere in the United States. And so it begs the question, why do you need to go farther than every corner of the United States? It, it's probably designed for carrying more weight. Um, so this uh, stage that they're testing, you know, the theory is that they're having trouble with the aerodynamics of making it efficient enough to get as high with its weight and its, and its shape. Um, they're hitting like this kind of um, trade-off that isn't working quite well enough in, in thrust and throttling the thrust enough so that they can get the second stage off. Um, so when we saw that cool video of Kim Jong-un in his leather bomber jacket standing next to this giant truck, that probably wasn't the missile they launched. It was probably a Hwasong 15. They swap, did a swap for it. 
uh, uh, and then um, in the meantime, they've been failing at the first stage of the Hwasong 17 and these kind of unusual ones. So if you want to follow along 26th of February, 4th of March, and 25th of May, each of those dates, they launched approximately um, you know, six, uh, 600 kilometers up and approximately three kilom 300 kilometers into the ocean. Those are, that's the signature of the type of stage that I've been looking at for whether it's uh, Hwasong 17. So, you know, even though we saw in the early days, you know, that the space program was used as kind of a cover for uh, military intention, that's still what we're seeing even right now, even this year with their tests of cameras. Um, and um, with that, I'll take a brief pause and I'm happy to answer questions, not just on the recent developments, but on some of the older developments or their plans for the moon and other things that they've made claims to. Um, but thank you again for having me and uh, back over to you, Juliana. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, thank you all three for, for these presentations. I think we've had a really comprehensive overview um, of the topic with some really interesting nuances. Um, a question for all of you, and please feel free to kind of interpret it according to, to what you've presented. Um, the two satellites that were placed in orbit were both for Earth observation purposes. Um, obviously, neither of them actually achieved that objective. Um, but I think what we're struggling to see, because the, the statements have never been entirely clear, is what the kind of overall aim is of, of the space program. We've now seen the announcement of the um, military reconnaissance fleet, um, uh, but previous statements have said that any space program, program sorry, um, would only ever have sort of civil purposes. So despite this kind of unclear, perhaps contradictory messaging, what do you think um, the, the ambitions for the space, space program are actually for? Is it, as we've um, also discussed, is it a mere spectacle? Is it more of a posturing? Or do we think there's actual sort of practical milestones? Feel free to go in the, in the order that we kind of started. Sure. I see Brian's uh, yeah. uh, go. <laughs> that's a tough question. Um, my opinion, and it's not, I mean, I don't have evidence to prove it one way or the other. My opinion is it's a mix of spectacle and probably justification to do some missile stuff. So let me unpack that a little bit. So as Melissa said, you know, early on, they were launching these, I'll say, very rickety liquid fuel rockets to what, you know, would be classified as an ICBM distance. And that freaked a lot of people in the US and elsewhere out. Uh, and, and there was a huge debate over whether or not those were actually ICBMs or whether they were space launch vehicles or whether they were space launch vehicles that are disguised as you know ICBM testing, right? And, and the nuance here is under the Outer Space Treaty, countries are allowed to conduct peaceful exploration of outer space and, and access to space and developing space technologies. Um, whereas North Korea is under specific sanctions uh, for its missile program under various UN Security Council resolutions. So there was a line of argument that they are labeling this a space launch and a space activity so they can get the experience of launching ICBMs and progress their missile capabilities, which they're not allowed to do. That was sort of the, the theory. And as Melissa pointed out very aptly, there's a long history of this, right? It's very difficult to unentangle and unpack those two things. Many countries kind of did them both the same thing. So now to the question, are they actually trying to develop competent, capable reconnaissance satellites, or is that just part of the charade, right? of, you know, saying they're doing that because, you know, under the outfit, they're allowed to put those things up or are they actually, or are they actually trying to do that? Uh, my sense is it's a little bit of, of both the, if they're doing it for the spectacles is what's expected of a powerful country this is where they demonstrate the technology. But I think it's also a little bit of a cover, right? I haven't seen the kind of dedicated development to really prove to me that they're, they're serious about the, remote sensing piece of it. But I'd be interested to hear what, what Elizabeth and Melissa have on say on this. Yes, thank you for 
Thank you, Brian, for those comments. Very interesting. So um, I think, you know, obviously I'm putting forth the argument that this is a spectacle driven configuration. And the, the reason I arrived at that conclusion was because of uh, my studies of how North Korean society has, has changed after the Cold War. So um, before the Cold War, when Kim Il-sung was in power, North Korea was um, a very different kind of state than it is today. Uh, of course, we also know very little about what's going on inside, but we can guess and we can uh, talk to defectors and hear what they have to say. And what, what they have been saying is that there's been an erosion of trust uh, between state and citizen. And what that means is that while Kim Il-sung was believe it or not, a pretty much beloved figure among ordinary North Koreans. Um, those were the good old days, um, a lot of de defectors have said. Uh, by contrast, you know, Kim Jong-il is equated with the famine years, uh, fit crop failure, um, the collapse of the economy, and lots of things, lots of, you know, plagues and troubles that beset North Korea starting in the 90s. So this begins to change the relationship of ordinary people to the state and the state is no longer able to provide for these people for ordinary citizens who who always who always relied on their government for food rations and and essential items but what what we have learned is that defectors while they no longer like the leadership um, a lot of them dislike kim jong un of course they cannot express it and a lot, obviously, defectors are a biased sample. They they just dis, they dislike their country of origin, so they left. However, um, when asked when um, what they thought about what the would you like to could you please extrapolate what you know the general population in North Korea is thinking, um, they usually say Kim Jong Un is widely disliked because he was a failed leader in many respects. But what they did say was they still maintain respect for the military. Um, so this was a source of pride and this was a source of trust. It was a symbol of, it was the last remaining like unblemished symbol of North Korean sovereignty. And um, I, think, I think the government realized this and that's why there's just been so much focus and so much attention paid to the North Korean military um, from the government's point of view and then using that as propaganda to continue to bolster the state and its, you know, its legitimacy. I mean, everybody says that, but it's true. Uh, I think the military has become the focal point of, of the relationship between state and citizen. And that's because of, a, you know, of the recent past, recent history. So um, I think that's one reason why satellite development and scientific development and the military, they all kind of mingle with each other and they go hand in hand. Um, so I, I kind of look at it from a societal point of view. What's what's happened there? What's left? What what do the citizens still accept as truth? And um, they accept as truth for them. They accept as truth uh, the strength and power of the military. That's a source of national pride for them. And that pride um, continues among you know you know in the sentiments of defectors in in South Korea uh, to this day. So that's it, it's it's an interesting observation. And I think it's not unrelated to why North Korea pursued some of these programs. Similar to uh, what Elizabeth said, um, I think that the propaganda value of a space program is not just to um, distract North Koreans from their day-to-day -day problems, but as we've seen with the US and the Soviet Union, as well as more recently in China, the space program is a national rallying point for all citizens to feel pride. And I mean, if you look at some of the propaganda that China's put out around its space program, you know, in Spring Festival, which is kind of like the, the preeminent holiday in China, they will have singers and MCs all praising the Tiangong space station and um, the astronauts who go there. And I think North Korea is trying to crib on those notes, essentially, that, you know, the space program can be a symbol of technological advancement and power. And they would very much like that same feeling for their people. They have, um, you know, joined relevant treaties and 
They have, even during what we suspect were missile launches, um, followed the pro protocol of notifying um, vehicles, uh, sort of sea mariners uh, in the area of their splashdown zones. And they, they have done that occasionally for, for a time. But, um, you know, I think ultimately their, their goal in space is to have a strong military. <laughs> so even though, you know, they may talk about space exploration, as Brian said, I think really it's about producing an ICBM and producing communications and reconnaissance satellites and potentially uh, counter space activities that they would feel more, more secure and more protected by. So for now, I think that um, it is really all about the militarization of the space area. Um, although if they can leverage that propaganda value to, in, you know, increase the pride of the people of North Korea, then Kim Jong-un will do it. It's a, a quick addendum. Um, after the first satellite launch, they, uh, as we'll say, they, they signed up to most of the relevant space treaties. They actually submitted a registration uh, to the United Nations uh, for the first satellite. There was a, actually sparked quite a bit of debate as to whether or not they should be allowed to do that because several countries, including the United States and Japan, view that launch as illegal, as in breaking the Security Council regulation. And and at the end of the day, they said, well, look, the, the treaty basically says that, you know, the countries are responsible for maintaining a national registry of space objects and just simply providing that information to the United Nations. Um, and so there's nothing there about determining validity or anything. So so it kind of went forward, but it was it was interesting how the politics of that played out and whether or not by accepting that registration was that, you know, uh, justifying or, or, or giving credence to North Korea's claims that this was a space launch as opposed to the U.S. position that it was a missile test, a legal missile test. Yeah, I just moved from Vienna, uh, where the UN Office of Outer Space Affairs is, and every time North Korea wants to participate in an activity, it's a huge legal headache for them, because they have signed the treaty, they are uh, allowed the right of peaceful space exploration, but the technology and everything associated with such a minefield that it's hugely cha challenging from a legal perspective and uh, of the United Nations to handle these situations. Thank you, Paul. Um, we have a couple of questions that I kind of want to, to bunch into one because they're all very similar and it's around allies uh, in general collaborations. Um, Brian, I think it was you who said at the very beginning, the kind of, international isolation that North Korea um, finds itself in is a huge sort of impediment uh, for any space program. Um, so a couple of those questions we've seen are, you know, who are potential allies uh, to help in terms of technology and launch capability, um, but also in terms of the kind of ground stations that we talked about that are especially uh, sort of important for any, uh, you know, ISR capabilities, who are the potential sort of uh, ground station allies, collaborations, where can we um, expect those? Uh, that's a difficult question uh, because I, not, no one really pops into mind at this point, in part because, you know, North Korea is under such immense international sanctions, right, that it's very difficult for anyone to work with them. So there are commercial entities that have global sets of ground stations, uh, 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 Kongsberg uh, in, in Sweden is one, and, and there's you know one in Norway and a few others that normally you could go and contract with them, and countries do and companies do, but I don't think North Korea can, at least overtly, because of the sanctions. Um, so I, I think it would have to be something covert, and that makes it a little harder to do, right? I mean, how do you hide a, a big radio dish you need to, to communicate satellites with so I, I don't know and i'd be interested in uh, Ms. melissa probably knows more than i do sort of the opportunities for technological cooperation on the missile space launch vehicle side of things but even my sense there is north korea really doesn't need a whole lot anymore um uh, they're now kind of operating off indigenous capabilities but I, i'd be interested in melissa's thoughts on that yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting and important question to pose, I think, because 
if we don't want North Korea continuing rocket launches and we don't, which, which could you know, qualitatively improve their existing missiles, um, you know, we need to offer them an alternative. But just as Brian said, you know, they're really sanctioned out of any meaningful um, or any legal cooperation um, with other uh, organizations. Um, all of this would be theoretical, but, you know, if we want to give you know, in a future agreement some kind of, um, you know, meaningful cap on missile testing, we will have to give them avenues that will allow them to explore space in a meaningful way. And then they would have to trust that we actually mean it. Um, and then, you know, there are, the only thing I can kind of think of, and I, I, my brain is a little fuzzy on this, is the cell phone deal with Egypt, um, where they, they had cell phone communications through a deal with Egypt. Uh, I can't remember how long ago. I don't know if maybe that involved some cooperation there where, they got access to communication through through that, but um, I don't think there's a real precedent uh, for for what we're talking about. But it would be, you know, if we really mean to have um, you know a meaningful missile um, agreement uh, that would stop new testing or new types of missiles, then we're going to have to give them other options for having um, you know mo modern activities in space, including imagery, communications, and, and so on. Elizabeth, is there anything you'd like to add to this? Otherwise, we'll... Um, not at the moment, thank you. All right, uh, we have one more question from uh, Nayoshi Owaku here at RUSI, um, and it's more of a nuclear question, but I think it applies to the space realm as well. Uh, and that's about the, you know, the limitations of the capabilities that we've talked about, um, but to what extent they have affected deterrence specifically uh, on the US, China, South Korean and Japanese side? Well, I mean, I'm hesitant to say that their nuclear capabilities are, 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 are limited because they have nuclear capabilities and nuclear weapons are, are pretty darn powerful. It only takes a few. Um, I, I, I mean, I think it has had an effect. Uh, you know, certainly it's caused a lot of consternation in Japan and South Korea and in the U.S. Um, it's driven, I'll speak for the U.S., uh, a, a huge investment in missile defenses and policies and all kinds of expenditures uh, to try and, um, and, and counter uh, that uh, with limited success, I would say. I mean, look at, you know, all of the, uh, uh, missile defense uh, emplacements in Alaska and Vandenberg and all the new radars and, you know, the GBIs, all of that is basically done or now, not entirely, but primarily to counter the North Korean nuclear threat. Um, so certainly the United States is taking that pretty seriously, is politically taking that very seriously. Um, I, I, I think similar in South Korea and Japan, although I, I know less, so I'm not going to I'm not going to speak about them. So um, it doesn't take a lot of nuclear capability to actually have a deterrent effect. Now, the question is, deterrence on what, right? <laughs> and that, that's always the age-old question when it comes to nuclear, to nuclear weapons, right? Or, you know, what exactly are you deterring who from doing? And I think the goal is to deter regime, forced regime change is probably what I would say the, the goal is. I suspect that it's having at least some of an effect on the U.S. calculus on that. Sorry, if I can just, oh, I'll sorry, if I can just quickly uh, butt in. I, I completely agree, obviously, in terms of the nuclear capabilities not being limited. Um, but I think, you know, if we were to apply this to the to the space realm more specifically, um, and perhaps, Brian, you, you can add to this after Melissa's comments as well, um, how do you see those deterrence efforts in terms of a kind of uh, spamming, uh, sorry, jamming and uh, cyber attack sphere? Let me think about that. Melissa, you want to <laughs> chime in first? Sure. I, I was going to just uh, chime in on now. She's a uh, question about nuclear deterrence. And um, to echo what Brian said, it doesn't take a lot of nuclear weapons to potentially deter someone. 
And um, I, I wouldn't describe their capabilities as, as limited, to be honest. I know there's still a debate about North Korea's reentry vehicle on its ICBM, but you know, I, it, that part of the rocketry is not the most difficult part of the rocketry. And I think from a policy standpoint, we really need to um, accept that they probably can deliver at least a single nuclear weapon overseas. And that's generally enough for, for people to stop aggressive behavior towards North Korea. It's not enough to prevent the US's nuclear umbrella from working. Certainly there would be massive retaliation, Un, like it would end, it would end the state. Um, but you know, um, but it does give uh, you know, anyone who might have been thinking about taking the state, North Korean state by force pause before they start down that path. I think that is, that is effectively deterred. Um, the open question, um, and we're still sort of um, unpacking this with Russia and Ukraine right now, is does a state with nuclear weapons um, increase potentially its likelihood of, of its own uh, threats to you know conventional threats towards its neighbors, and um, you know increasingly I think we see that um, states are willing to make conventional threats when they have nuclear weapons behind behind their actions. So that is still something that we're unpacking in political science. Uh just on the on the space capabilities, I don't think those have a deterrence effect. Anything like what nuclear weapons does, I, I see those more as um, either you know uh, things to be used um, either for 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 nuisance and for signaling outside of armed conflict, or for actually affecting somebody else's space capabilities during an armed conflict. So, for example, if there ever was. Uh, you know, a return to a hot war on the Korean Peninsula. So you can assume that there's going to be widespread GPS jamming um, as a result, as a as a as a function of the hostilities to deny it to one or both sides, right? I, I, that I don't see as the same sort of deterrent effect uh, as nuclear weapons would have. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have space for one more question. It's something that uh, Melissa briefly mentioned uh, at the end of her remarks, um, and that's the sort of civil space program. I was wondering uh, if each of you could kind of describe what you think sort of next thing we'll see uh, in terms of the civil space program. Melissa, you mentioned the moon, I believe. Um, so if you want to start us off, perhaps. Yeah, so... Um... Now, now that I've said it, I have to dig it out of my brain, but I think in 2016, um, uh, North Korea actually said that they intended to go to the moon. And um, we haven't seen um, any uh, rockets carry people yet. And I don't know, you know, you know, maybe they meant to send a rocket to the moon unmanned or uncrewed, I should say. But um, um, you know, it's, it's not something we've seen yet, but they've made the claim, um, it, you know, and it could theoretically happen. There's probably some years ahead uh, for them to do that. Uh, but, um, you know, rather, I think rather than laughing at their goal, um, you know, it might be an excellent opportunity as we try to build treaties with and agreements with North Korea to provide the kind of um, the kind of desirable uh, activities that they want to do that are not strictly speaking militarily. You, and I'm spitballing here. You know, this, some of this stuff is all everything is deeply political, and I have no idea where this will all go. But um, you know, could North Korea join? a Chinese space mission to the Tiangong or something like this in exchange for deeply reducing its um, you know, missile capabilities uh, in exchange for you know, a moratorium uh, on missile launches or some of the things that uh, the US and allies and the rest of the world want. 
um, it's, you know, it's hard right now to, uh, to suss out exactly what North Korea wants because they've really um, distanced themselves from any communication with the outside world uh, about anything but COVID. Um, so it's, it's still kind of hard to know what inducements it might take to get them to sit down at the table. But if, um, you know, space has a propaganda value and it is um, palatable enough for the political actors on the scene to stomach it, um, then, uh, you know, it's worth investigating. Yeah, I would say I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little more skeptical that, that that's a serious policy proposal for the North Koreans. I, I think it's, it's more into kind of continuing the spectacle and the, the, the propaganda side that Elizabeth has talked into. I mean, if they really are serious, then, then maybe there is an opening for the kind of thing that Melissa just, just, just talked about, right? If, if they, that's something they do care about, then maybe we can trade that off. But I, 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 I'm, I, I'm skeptical of that. I, I think it was more of, well, everyone's talking about the moon, so let's get on the parade and, and let, let's mention it along the way. I, and, and while it'd be nice if we could trade, you know, a, you know, a North Korean astronaut for, you know, getting rid of a bunch of missiles. Oh man, I, I, I don't, I don't see how they would do that, but that'd be cool if we, if we, if that was a possibility. <laughs> Elizabeth, is there anything in your research um, that uh, sort of touched on the uh, civil space program, even if it's a sort of, uh, I guess, scientific purposes for the for the program? Um, frankly, no, but I just wanted to kind of offer a related comment. Um, I think the other piece of this puzzle is maybe US policy toward North Korea. Um, that's That's a really important part of all of this. Um, I mean, I'm old, old enough to remember a time when North Korea appeared to be, you know, crawling out of its shelf. And I'm not talking about the Trump Kim Jong Un summits. <laughs> I'm actually talking about two decades earlier, when, you know, US Secretary of State Madeleine Albright visited Pyongyang, and there was, you know, a, a general mood of like, a, a willingness on the part of Kim Jong Il to ease tensions. There was really something there. And then um, a lot of things happened domestically in US politics uh, that brought a different administration to power. That administration had very different policies toward North Korea. I mean, they just turned everything uh, upside down, frankly. And it has not been the same since. And I think the general, um, the general direction of US, US foreign policy after 9-11 kind of, you know, bled into all other fronts, including North Korea. And we need to keep that in mind that there was a time, there may have been a time when North Korea thought differently and was not really, you know, uh, engaging in, you know, aggressive uh, military maneuvers that we, we are so familiar with right now. So that is an open-ended question. Um, there is there's no evidence that they would have you know behaved differently if somebody else was elected president in 2000, but it's complicated. And the reason it's complicated is because North Korea is also it's it's my I mean I would argue North Korea is also taking it day by day. There's a tendency in the Western press for us to assume that they know exactly what they're doing, that they have this you know. They have this playbook and they, you know, the, it, it, everything is kind of set in stone and they stick to it and there's just no wiggle room or flexibility on their part. But actually they're taking it day to day because their society is changing. And I think this is the bigger, this is the, this, this is the bigger emergency for, for the state. Like how do we deal with a more knowledgeable population who's aware of the outside world, who's aware that, you know, we've been lying to them. How do we keep them at bay? That is the bigger problem for them. And I think that ties in with how they, how they um, present themselves on the world stage, including militarily. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you all of you. We've run out of time. It's exactly three o'clock uh, here in London. So um, thank you very much for those who've enjoyed this uh, and want to find out a little bit more. We have the next event in the series happening tomorrow at 3 p.m. Uh, you can still register, so please do that on the website and that it will be the event on organized crime. So I hope uh, that we can see many of you there again. 
And in the first instance, though, thank you very much to our fantastic panelists for sharing their research out today. And thank you to everyone joining us online for their fantastic questions.